everyone. Welcome back to Walking with Christ. I'm the host for this evening, Braden Penny, and I have the pleasure of being joined with Jacob today. Uh, Jacob, can you just give us a brief introduction of yourself? Hey, so my name is Jacob LaBelle. Um, I was baptized March 8th, 2023 in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A um, little bit about me is, you know, I'm a recovering addict and, you know, and it took me a while to find the gospel and I'm just here to just kind of spread the word a little bit. Awesome, thank you. So to help us kind of get a better idea of where you're coming from, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what your life was like growing up, your childhood, some of those things? Yeah, so growing up it was kind of a little bit rough. Um, had a physically and verbally abusive father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would hit me probably about every night. Um, although the one good thing is, you know, my mom w was always there for me. Um, growing up, another thing that was rough was I ex experienced a lot of loss. Um, most of my family passed at a young age. Um, I remember I was probably about eight years old when I woke up seeing my grandfather get pulled out of the house and body back. So that's kind of what got me started to um, fall into not the best crowd. And, mm -hmm. you know, just it was a little rough growing up. So, and what kind of uh, influence did your upbringing have later in life? I say later in life, you're still pretty young. Yeah. Um, but obviously you had those experiences growing up. Um, how do you think that shaped you into who you are today? I'd say it helped me in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people that there's no such thing as a mistake. There's blessings and lessons. And as long as you can take away something from even a horrible situation, it's a blessing. Um, and with everything that's happened, I feel like I've come out of a kind of positive person. And I just want to pay forward, you know, what people have done, you know, and shown kindness to me for. And I want to be able to use what I've gone through to help other people, you know, go through similar situations. And, um, you know, addiction is not an easy thing to, you know, overcome. And one of my friends is still really, really deep into it. So I want to use my experience to try to help get them clean as well. Gotcha. So it sounds like you took a lot of those experiences and, uh, use them as learning experiences to grow and progress rather than let you let that tear you down. Yeah. I think that's very good. So at what point were you introduced to the gospel for the first time? So when I was probably about eight years old, um, mm -hmm. growing up in Orangevale, a lot of people are members of the church. And with the school I went to, a lot of people were members of the church as well. One of my good friends was um, a member, and so I'd go to a few church activities and um, I didn't really start, and my mom was a cultural anthropologist. I knew a lot about all sorts of different religions at a young age, but I didn't really start learning about the gospel until um, my, at the time, girlfriend started introducing me to it, and that was about a year and a half ago. There you go. So you, you joined the church uh, just last month, but it sounds yeah. like you had a lot of little experiences leading up to that. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't... Um, it was there. It was around. Yeah, it was around, but not really something that I got the chance to experience mm -hmm. until later. Gotcha. So when did you start to take more of an interest in the church and the gospel? Yeah, so really when I started um, dating my at-the-time girlfriend is when I started getting more involved with the church, you know, because I wanted to learn about her faith and how I could support her. You know, I didn't want to you know, make her feel uncomfortable or make it feel like, you know, um, her faith is not recognized. Um, and over time, it just kind of grew on me. So. There you go. Well, let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. You said over time it started to grow on you. Uh, how did that happen? Like, could you paint a picture for us? Like, Yeah, so the missionaries put it really well. Um, every religion is like a piece of a broken mirror. And then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the most correct and has the most pieces. And growing up with a mom who's a cultural anthropologist, you know, I learned about a bunch of different religions, grew up kind of reading the Bible a little bit. And over time, I just, you know, reading the Book of Mormon and learning about the church, I did notice that over time, those pieces just seem to fit in a little bit better than they do in other faiths. And, you know, it's, the church kind of started feeling like a home over time as well. Definitely. I hear you. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? So that would be about eight months into my missionary lessons. Um, 
and I was still having lessons with one of uh, this, my first sister missionary, actually. I was like, I do want to become a member, but I don't feel like I'm worthy to become a member. So, you know, it's one of those things that's a process, and I just kept trying to strive to be better and better. Um, but what really set it in stone for me was when my uh, last sister missionary just went, you know, the Lord doesn't, you know, need perfection. He just wants effort. And that's really what set it in stone going, okay, maybe I just sit this one back. There you go. That can definitely be a struggle, right? Thinking that we're not good enough. And, oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the hardest things to overcome oftentimes. It really is. Yeah. Because the Lord loves us no matter what, but sometimes we don't recognize that. Yeah, I mean, and for a long time I thought, at a young age, you know, if there was a God, he left me a long time ago. With, you know, some of the stuff that I saw, went through, and some of the stuff that I did to, and what, you know, happened to me. Um, I was just like, you know, if there is a God, he left me a long time ago. But um, over time, I'm like, you know, there was just little tiny moments that made me go, okay, maybe he's not left me yet. So it was those little, uh, little experiences where maybe you felt God's love again and yeah. started to, to learn that for yourself. Yeah. So was it more personal experiences that led to that? Or was it just people kind of telling you that that was the case, that God loved you? Um, it was a bit of both, but it was mostly just personal experiences. Um, and I could make a very long list of them. Mm. You know, there was some that I didn't even realize until later. That you know, it was like maybe God is looking out for me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. So, um, how did you come into contact with the missionaries? You mentioned you were meeting with them for some time. Like, how did that all come about? Yeah. So. Um, my at-the-time girlfriend, I had one missionary lesson with her. I didn't really get the chance to do more because life was a little chaotic. Right. But um, shortly after they transferred out, um, and it was at her baptism, I got in touch with a set of the sister missionaries. And um, they you know, asked if I'd be willing to do a lesson. I'm just like, you know what, sure, why not? Seems like fun. But um, so that's really kind of where it all started. So you mentioned previously that you had some personal experiences that led you to feel God's love more in your life. Uh, would you be willing to share an experience that you've had that helped you learn that? Yeah, sure. So one of the most significant ones and what really got me to um, accept that, you know, maybe he's still around was when I ended up at the temple. Um, I mentioned previously that I'm a recovering addict. I kind of had a merry go of substances that I would, you know, circle through. Um, it got to the point where I had to uh, take one, substan one substance in particular to function normally. Um, and if I you know, couldn't get that substance, I, was, I couldn't function. I would literally just be in bed all day. I couldn't do anything. Um, so I kind of fell into you know, the depths of addiction at a young age too. I started doing substances when I was about eight, eight to 10. Um, but what really got me to um, have one of those significant experiences was um, it was the day that the man that raised me passed away. Um, I intentionally tried to overdose on my substance of choice. Um, and while overdosed, um, I was, you know, not in the best state of mind. So I ended up stealing um, a motorcycle. Something I used to do when I ran with not the best crowd was I used to steal very expensive um, cars and bikes. Um, so I stole a motorcycle and um, it was a super bike. So I just decided to, you know, say a prayer for the first time, you know, willingly um, on my own. And it was just short and simple, just God, whatever happens, happens. Um, I end up hitting 220 miles per hour. I say that prayer one more time. You know, just put my head down. I'm not even looking at the road. I just have my head down the whole time, just looking at the dash, seeing how fast I can get. Uh, Redline that bike in sixth gear, 225 miles per hour. I look up and I just see a, a light on a hill. And I just, I don't know why. I just felt the urge to go there. And um, so I you know, slowed down a little bit, got off the freeway, and just followed that light. And next thing I know, I ended up at the temple. And, you know, I just felt a sense of peace that I didn't along, 
you know, I didn't have a belt in a long time. And I felt the urge to um, go and climb onto the roof. So, you know, went over to one of the sides of the building and I used to do competitive climbing and, you know, free solo. So, you know, no gear or anything, no one would look after me. I, you know, saw that side of the building. I'm like, eh, challenge climb, let's do it. I uh, climbed to the top and I just sat there. You know, I just sat there all night and what, just watched the sunrise the next day. And, you know, I took enough of a, that one substance to kill me. Um, and I hit some very, very fast speeds. I should be, you know, dead right now, but I'm still around. And that's what made me think, maybe God has more in store for me. Because, you know, when I saw the sunrise, that was another sense of peace. That I just, it felt like the first time, you know, that I ended up at the temple or saw the temple. Um, and just seeing that sunrise, it was like, you know, it's a new day. I need to get better, you know. If there's a new day, there needs to be a new me. So that was kind of what started getting me clean. What a story. Yeah. That was the same date that I also got baptized, March 8th. Wow. So. Exactly a year later? Um, two years later. Two years later. Okay. Wow. I think that's, that's amazing how something that otherwise could have been a very negative and even very tragic situation uh, in the end turned out positive. So after you had this, this very spiritual experience, um, what did you do about it? What action did you take from there? So from there, my uh, first plan of action was get clean, get sober. Because mm -hmm. um, I was taking substances to function normally. Like I'd just go into the bathroom at school and whether it would be, you know, pills, shooting it, slamming it, it would be, I had to have something. So, um, you know, I, you can't cut yourself off completely. Um, so I started weaning myself off of uh, that substance. Mm -hmm. And being the addict I was, I had to have something in my system. So I replaced it with a slightly less uh, harmful substance. And then from there, um, I'd wean myself off that one a little more and replace it with a slightly less harmful substance. Um, just to kind of make it a little bit easier on myself over time. So, you know, and it took about a year. Um, it got to the point where I was just smoking a lot of cigarettes and drinking a lot of caffeine. Um, but, you know, once I got to that point, I'm like, okay, well, I quit my substance of choice, the one that I had to, you know, take to function normally. I can quit smoking. And, you know, and that was easy. It was just one day, just cut it off. Mm. I was only smoking just to keep a headache away at that rate, so. Sounds like you've had quite the experience that's led you to A little bit. <laughs> so you had this experience, and then two years later, at this point, you've um, overcome addiction to substances. Uh, you've grown in faith and developed a testimony. Um, so what's, what's next for you? So what's next for me is, because once an addict, always an addict. At the end of the day, those cravings just never go. So I'm still going to NA meetings, you know, just trying to get my life together, just trying to get, you know, my life figured out. Um, and what's next for me is, you know, while doing that is I want to try to bring other people to Christ and I want to try to get other people clean too. One of my big life goals right now is, because I went through it on my own. I had one other person that held me accountable because they were an addict as well that were trying to get clean, that they passed on my shoulder about six months ago. Um, is, you know, I tried helping them get clean, but I couldn't do it before they passed. Um, is, I want to try to live in her memory as well. And because she wanted to get clean, she wanted to help other people get clean. So, you know, it's kind of my way of paying forward what she did for me, holding me accountable. So, you know, bring other people to NA meetings, try to get them clean, because um, it's not an easy thing to do, and especially not easy to do alone. Definitely, that's a very positive mindset. Yeah. So what would your message to someone else who's maybe having similar struggles and is thinking about giving up, what, what would your message to them be? Substances are not worth your life. Don't let it rule your life. I let them rule mine for way too long. Um, and there is help out there, and there is hope. You don't realize it. You know, when you're in the depths of addiction, you just think, you know, 
where's my next fix going to be? Or some people get in substances for different reasons too. So some people take them because they're feeling, you know, too much and want to feel nothing. I took them because I was feeling nothing and wanted to feel something. So in someone with the case with me, I'd say that there's other ways to feel something. There's plenty of other outlets. Mm -hmm. I, one thing that really did, you know, save my life and keep me away from substances too was, you know, cars and motorcycles, you know, being able to wrench. You know, if you find a healthy outlet like that, there's really something to look forward to at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you. And how do you think the atonement of Jesus Christ has applied to you in that process as well? So it's applied in a number of ways. Um, you know, with the atonement, you know, he died for our sins. And for a while I kept thinking, because, you know, I kept sinning. Like, the word of wisdom for me is not easy. I still struggle with it. Um, and, you know, he's this perfect being who died for us and I just would never feel worthy. You know, I'd be like, I keep messing up. Um, but realizing that, you know, he took upon the sin and knows what I've gone through just really does give me a sense of comfort and it also gives me a sense of drive to be able to, you know, keep going and be like, you know, if he knows what I'm going through, he can give me the strength to get through this. Thank you. I think it's that that comfort and drive as well as that you mentioned that gives us that power and that ability to overcome the trials in our lives. Yeah. So obviously you've felt the power of Christ's atonement in your life. So how does someone go about accessing that power? How was it for you? So for me, it was a very long process. And for me, I'd say repentance is definitely the number one step. You know, repent and read your scriptures and then it might not be easy. Like it's still hard for me to do and mm -hmm. I still struggle with praying. Um, it's taken me a long time to be able to you know, say my prayers out loud, but those little steps will definitely help more than people realize. Definitely. So what does repentance look like? Like if I'm someone who doesn't really know how to repent, but knows that I need to, where do I start? So start by admitting that there is a problem mm. and admitting that you're messing up. If you realize, you know, you have a problem and then you can say, what can I do to make it right? Pray about it, read your scriptures, who knows, maybe something will come up. Like with me, I was just, you know, it was the loss of the man that raised me. He was really, really big into faith and I had never touched a Bible a day in my life. And I just thought, you know, it's about time. So I flipped, you know, just opened it to a random page and it was, you know, Psalms 90 verse 12. You know, that's just the verse I put my finger on, which is teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so that for me was kind of a start of going, okay, our days are numbered, got to accept it. What can I do to, you know, pay forward what people have done for me and learn? But, you know, repentance kind of comes into play with that as well because, you know, he's the only other person at the time that really knew about my substance abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me to repent and he told me to read my scriptures and I'd be like, eh, yeah, I, you know, I admit I have a problem, but scriptures aren't really my thing. And he looked at me and he just said, okay. And he's like, don't say I didn't warn you though. He's like, they help. But, um, so just admit that you have a problem pray about it, see what you can do to move forward and then act on it. For me, um, it was always like two steps forward, one step back. You know, like I would go, you know, six months being clean and then relapse. I mean, my last relapse was probably about nine months ago. Um, and, you know, that was a step back. And I look at it as people, whenever they relapse, they say, okay, I'm going back to square one. I just look at them and I say, no, you're not going back to square one. You're learning from it. I said, you're still at the same square, you're just taking a step back. So when you had those experiences where you fell back on old habits, uh, was that ever discouraging at times? It really was, but at the same time, you got to realize as, you know, it's human nature, people go to what they know is safe. Mm -hmm. For some people, that's faith. Some people, it's substances like me. Um, so it just kind of depends 
um, for me it was discouraging because I would, you know, go back to substances and I would just, you know, be like, this isn't right. I've come so far. What can I do to get better? And I'm, I, I'm like, I'm slacking. I'm falling behind. And then I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's start again. Let's, you know, round two. Let's go. And eventually round two turned into three and three turned into four. But, you know, whether it's, you know, two, three steps forward, one step back, you're always making progress, which is really, at the end of the day, what matters. Definitely. So it sounds like you're using that that vision of progress to help you overcome that kind of discouragement. Yeah, if you can keep a good mentality through it all, that will, in the long run, really help you out and keep you from getting too discouraged. Because yeah. a lot of people in getting clean, they just say, oh, this is too hard and give up. Versus me, I, you know, look at it as a challenge. And I, you know, say, all right, I'm one of those people that people would say, oh, you can't do this. And I'd be like, all right, watch me. <laughs> So when I look at it as a challenge, I say, all right, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to get it done. So that's what kind of kept me going. Definitely. I think that principle can be true in a lot of aspects of life, not just overcoming addiction, but anytime we're trying to change, right? Cause yeah. Change can really be difficult. Um, and I think that comes back to what you were talking about earlier with relying on the Savior and His atonement. Yeah. So... Um, kind of closing up here, uh, but would you be willing to share your testimony of Jesus Christ for the viewers? Yeah, sure. So at a young age, I fell into a bad crowd. I, you know, got caught up in stealing, you know, violence, um, just because at the time it was just keeping me away from home. Um, not necessarily my home life wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best either. And at the time, it just seemed like fun. And some other stuff happened, which caused me to get into substances as a way to cope. But um, over, you know, between the loss of the man that raised me, and you know, I was the one that found him. I, you know, I found him laying on the floor. And that was a big turning point. And that is when I thought, you know, I had thought God left me beforehand, but that really kind of emphasized, okay, yeah, no, why would he do this? You know, I'm like, people say we have a loving Heavenly Father, it's clear he doesn't love me, was my thought process at the time. Um, intentionally overdosed, hopped on that bike, hit 220, 225 miles an hour, give or take. You know, looked at, you know, said a prayer, looked at the temple, and just went, huh, I gotta go there. But that sense of peace, it's not like something I could ever describe. And each time I go to the temple, or I'm going through a rough spot, and you know, whether I look at a picture of the man that raised me, or I start reading my scriptures, or I just go to the temple, it's that sense of peace every time. And that is when I realized, you know, maybe God is looking out for me. And about three months after that whole situation, um, someone came into my life, my at the time girlfriend, um, and she started bringing me to the gospel. You know, she started bringing me to church and church activities, um, and you know, missionary lessons and whatnot. So I'm thinking that's that was God's way of saying, I'm still here. You know, and you know, you have to realize too that each day is a gift and not a given right. So what I always tell people is, through getting clean and whatnot, and through my testimony and people are like, you have a strong testimony, and they're like, you know, you're going to stay clean forever. And I'm like, I, I can't promise that. They're like, why? And I say, I can't promise that I'll be clean forever, but I can, be prom I can promise that I'll be clean for one more day. And you got to realize that everything's one day at a time, and it's the same way with faith. You know, you got to take things slow each day at a time, try to improve on something. Definitely. Thank you. That was very tender. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this evening on Walking with Christ, and we'll catch you next time. Be good. Hi there, I'm Sister Sumption, and thank you for choosing to grow closer to Jesus Christ with us. We are members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and our focus is to help others learn about Jesus Christ and change their lives by becoming new through the Atonement of Jesus Christ. We can help you learn about Him and how His restored gospel can help you. 
Comment below this video or message us to learn more today.